Welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning, and the master taster of whiskey.com. And today we have two questions to answer in the FAQ number nine. And uh, the first is from our forum on whiskey.com where a user asked about the value of a full crate of White Horse blended whiskies. How's the value? And the second one is about uh, these whiskies, these sherry monsters. How are they produced? Where do they come from? And how do we, do we distinguish them from other sherry whiskies? Yeah, the first. Um, a user at our forum asked how much is a full crate of White Horse whiskey uh, worth when it is a few decades old. Twelve bottles of White Horse, I don't know if twelve or six, no idea. Uh, a full crate. And, mm, <laughs> I'm sorry, this whiskey isn't thirty or forty years old. No, this was a normal blended whiskey and this matured for typically three years and a day in oak casks because this was and is still is the law for the maturation of whiskey, the minimum maturation of whiskey in cask three years. And from this they are uh, they're put into the bottle and the bottle rested for decades and there is no maturation, there is some minor maturation, yes, but no major maturation in the bottle going on. So you have a three-year-old whiskey which rested for 40 years in a glass bottle. So this is no old whiskey, this is a young whiskey, a young whiskey from former times. Now you can discuss the good old times when everything was worse. Mm. Oops. Um, well, the production capabilities of the industry wasn't that perfect as it is today. When you have a fermenter, uh, a washback, and you haven't been careful, then some bacteria came into the wash or into the wort and the fermentation, well, took place and uh, vinegar bacteria acted as well and the result was very sour. Well, for a, for a malt whiskey this cask was completely unusable. Oh, then the, the sour uh, wash went into the distillation and the final product was, well, quite sour. I had one <laughs> in former times, from 84. Um, uh, it was a brutality. And this is a, a problem that these minor qualities went into the blends as well. So the input into the blends wasn't that good as it was in former times. Well, perhaps people liked those old style of blended whiskey then. But moving forward with better production processes and quality uh, resulted in better, better sales. So it might be better today than in the good old times. Um, well, then mass production, reduction in overall quality because you do not mix five or four, six year old whiskies in, but just all whiskies will have three years and a day, not only 80% of them. Uh, yes, so there are some uh, big business influences which aren't that good. But you have to weight them against uh, the minor quality, overall quality in former times. <clears throat> and this is the main answer as the value of those bottles. Well, I think those cheap bottles from former times are not worth than the cheap bottles today. Because cheap bottles were bought for yeah, not for connoisseurs, but for people who drank whiskey. Not sipping whiskey, drinking whiskey. For drinkers. I always avoid uh, the word drinkers. I'm drinking whiskey. No, I'm not drinking whiskey. I'm no alcoholic. I'm savoring whiskey. I'm sipping whiskey. 
small amounts. Yeah. So, and the drinker, he looks after the money, and so a, re a relatively cheap whiskey will not rise in, in prices. There are, with this particular crate, uh, some differences because uh, White Horse was or is a company, I, th I, s I think it's still in the market uh, inside the Diageo uh, conglomerate. Um, and inside the White Horse distillers in former times there had been the Lagavulin distillery and the Craig Lachy distillery. You can see at the Craig Lachy distillery when I was there last time uh, there was a, uh, a sign on the side showing this White Horse. And uh, on the Lagavulin, I've seen that in the past. I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's still there. Aha, I have a Lagavulin here. Oh. No. No. There had been, I think there had some white horse marks on those bottles. But no, not, not today. <clears throat> and if you now have a connoisseur who collects Lagavulin and this one would like how the old Lagavulin tasted inside a blend like the White Horse, they might be interested in those bottles. And also the people who like well, who do not collect only the bottles of Lagavulin, but also, well, all according uh, devotionalia, or how it's called, no idea, um, then they would look for water jugs and glasses with the Lagavulin riding on it, and for crates with a white horse uh, label on it, either painted uh, or burned. Um, and they might be interested in that box. And so I would say if you're able to find somebody who is looking for this crate, you might get a hundred dollars for it. Because it will be quite huge. The sign on it, if it's without a sign, no value at all. Um, but if there are marks from White Horse Distillers on it, then it has some, some value. And for the bottles, well, if you don't find a collector who says, well, this crate at full, that's it, uh, then you can sell it for 20 to 30 each bottle, because it has to compete with the actual bottlings uh, of the cheap or uh, the branded whiskies. Branded whiskies means they are a little bit above nothing. Uh, and the high value, which we like that much, uh, stands a lot above. So these uh, branded whiskies. Um, well, and if you're able to communicate that there is Lagavulin in it, uh, then you might get 30 to 40. At 100 for uh, the crate, then you will result in 400 to 500 as a total value for the crate. If there are 12 bottles in it, if it's only a crate for six, mm, accordingly less. Yeah, this is it with the value of the old blended whiskies. Most often uh, the value isn't there because uh, the, the mood of the connoisseurs left the bands and moved over to the single malts. And this reduced the value of these old blended whiskies a lot. Second question is, how do you receive sherry monsters? like this bottle. It's a Glen Grand from 1962, uncolored and diluted to 40% alcoholic content and it's still that dark. Incredible, isn't it? How do you receive such dark bottles? And they are called mm, sherry monsters. We have to know some, well, important facts about the sherry cask maturation of whiskies. I think I have to, to take a video about that very soon. Um, you have uh, European oak, which is a very heavy, strong 
oak, which brings on the long, long run quite bitter aromas into a whiskey. And on the other hand, you have the American white oak, which is very elegant, fine, not that intense. And for having a sherry monster, uh, with this intense kick, uh, you have to have those European sherry casks. And uh, I opened that bottle, I think, two years ago, and, and you see there's not much went out of the bottle, and friends had uh, sometimes too. Um, because if you have more than a normal or a smaller dram, then you feel the oak in the morning still in your mouth. It's so intense and biting oak. And, uh, so it's quite difficult with these sherry monsters if they come from a first fill European sherry oak and rest it in that oak for decades. In this case, 46 years, in 1962 and bottle 2008. Uh, 46 years in European sherry oak. In 62, they hadn't haven't been any uh, sherry casks from the US. Um, then you have, as I said, to have a first fill that after the sherry, the whiskey went immediately and stood there for the decades. Then you will result in these hefty whiskies. But uh, people knew that these long maturing whiskies in those European oak casks were so bitter in the end. There is this uh, triple, quadruple espresso taste in them. It's not for everybody. Um, be careful if you do not like uh, bitter aromas. Stay away from those bottles. And so in the past they used the European sherry casks several times and to receive such a dark coloring according to the taste, they put Paxaret into the cask. This is a, well, a condensed uh, grape juice from the grapes of the sherry. And this is very sweet, very thick, like a syrup. And they pressed it uh, by compressed air into the porous walls of the staves. And then, Perhaps there was a little left at the bottom. They filled up with fresh whiskey. And then you got a first fill Paxaret cask. It was never called that way. Um, and people always said, well, the old cherry casks, they were so much better than the new ones because there's so much sherry in it because they use it not only for a, a single uh, season, but for five, six, eight seasons, and therefore the sherry is so strong. No, completely wrong. Uh, the porous walls are filled to a 95% in a single season. If you have a second season, there will be <laughs> one, two percent more. Uh, this is not uh, <laughs> with which you, you win the war, no. Uh, what happens with these multiple or maturations of sherry, you take out uh, the, well, the tannins from the walls so that the resulting whiskey isn't that bitter. So it's more mass compatible and the sherry will be, well, have more influence in comparison uh, to the oak. This is what happens with old casks, but you lose the vanilla and the caramel through the uh, temperature uh, treatment of the cask, the toasting and the burning from the inside, there those uh, uh, compounds are produced from the wood itself, you lose it to the sherry. So those uh, multiple used casks, when they're writing on the back of a bottle, a very old cask from Spain, then you you know there's no vanilla and no caramel left in the casks. They're just coming light tannins from the European oak and the sherry from the sherry. 
<clears throat> and therefore they used this pexret, pressed it in the walls, and then uh, you had this sherry influence a lot more, but uh, nothing else. Today they're typically using a finishing process where you have an American white oak cask and from this you get the vanilla and the caramel and light coconut and whatever and then you have the finishing in sherry casks where you get the sherry fruit and a very light bitterness in that short time not for decades just for months or, or a few years. This brings a more balanced uh, sherry cask whiskey and not this monster. And the monster not only counts for the Paxaret, but also for the tannins, the bitterness in the whiskey. Um, and today, today they, well, they use the ex bourbon casks and the finishing process. They, yeah, they use the casks longer for longer for more often. So refill sherry casks for finishing. And this is, well, the fruitiness is gone with the first finishing process, all the fruitiness from the sherry is gone because it's, it salutes very good in alcohol and tears everything out of the wall and then it's gone. Then nobody hinders them by law or regulation to refill the ex whiskey cask, finishing whiskey cask with sherry again in Scotland. And now the sherry uh, refills the porous walls of those sherry casks uh, for six months, eight months. I think that's enough. And after that, you take, you, you empty it. I have no idea how much of liquid is left in. Mm, you hear some criticism? Might be. No idea. Um, and these vet sherry casks are then reused for finishing and most of the finishing is the fruitiness of the sherry and light tannins uh, from the cask and the vanilla and the caramel has to come from the first maturation period uh, of the white oak casks. I have to, to take a video of this. Yeah, the next one will be uh, the principles of maturation of whiskey casks. So here we go. Uh, if you have whiskies, those d very dark whiskies from 88 and before, then the chances that you have those Pexret maturation is quite high. And I would suggest that this one not only has first filled sherry casks, original sherry casks, but also one or two, or three or four. Now they have their blending vat has a capacity of five to eight casks. So there might, might be one or another Paxret cask in as well. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned. There's more to come. And if you would like to ask questions, please do so. Hashtag whiskey.com without a dot in between. I'm searching for that. And uh, please discuss all these things with me in our forum on whiskey.com. I'm happy to answer your questions in more detail there. Thank you.